Congressman Massey, thanks for joining us this afternoon. Thanks for having me on. Our viewer, Mike Widoff, wants to know about the government shutdown. He is concerned about a government shutdown. Do you think Congress is going to come up with an agreement to fund the government, keep, let it keep paying its bills past October 1st? You know what, we get to this point every year, September 30th rolls around and Congress hasn't done its homework. It, the government would be at no risk of a shutdown if we had passed 12 appropriations bills and if the Senate had done their job. Now we passed six in the House and the Senate passed zero appropriations bills. And now we're at this impasse where we'll probably get a continuing resolution on September 30th. I'm one of 31 Republicans who said they will not vote to fund Planned Parenthood. So it will be interesting to see how that resolves itself. In any case, when we do fund the government and uh, through a CR, I advocate that we should fund it for a full year. But you have our leadership here in the House that are saying that we should only fund it until December and that we should have another crisis in December right before Christmas. I think it's absolutely the wrong way to govern and I'm a proponent of funding the government for a full year and using 12 appropriations bills to do it. And you're right, we have been in exactly that situation before. So I know what you're in favor of. What do you think is going to happen? Are we going to get that one year or do you, do you see this coming up again in December? It will absolutely come up in December. What they're going to do is they're going to use the pressure of Christmas break. They'll give us a 1,600-page omnibus bill, and they'll say, if you vote for this, you can go home to your family, and if you don't vote for it, you're going to stay here for Christmas. And um, what they want to do is bust the budget caps in December. The Republicans want to spend more on the military. The Democrats want to spend more on social programs. And there'll be probably be a dollar-for-dollar dollar trade-off where both parties get what they want, and we get more than a, another trillion dollars of deficit spending. Is the economy strong enough for this kind of uncertainty? The stock market doesn't like uncertainty. We could see a Federal Reserve rate hike on Thursday. Either way, there, there's been volatility in the market. You know, are you seeing the economy as fundamentally strong? I mean, can it withstand this uncertainty? Well, first of all, the, the economy has been propped up by the Federal Reserve, having interest rates at near zero for an uncharacteristically long period of time. I think it, it's time not just for the Fed to increase the interest rate, but to let them float and become uh, what the market would, would bear. And uh, I think it's wrong for Washington, D.C. to try and drive the economy by setting the value of money. Now, could the, could the economy be uh, robust in the absence of Planned Parenthood funding? Absolutely. In fact, you could take all of that spending and you could spend it on women's health programs without spending it Planned Parenthood. So, you know, the question of whether the economy would, would suffer from a partial government shutdown needs to be put to the president. Because I think what you'll see is I think you'll see the House of Representatives pass a spending bill that funds everything except for Planned Parenthood. Now the question is, will the president want to shut down the government and risk the economy based on funding for the abortions and the types of uh, activity that we've seen on these videos recently where baby parts are being sold? Viewer Alan Dale Tackett wants you to speak to the Kim Davis clerk of court same-sex marriage license case. He says that uh, you made the comment that SCOTUS made law on June 26. He wants to know how would you feel if an Islamic government worker refused to do part of their job because of religious beliefs? Would you have the same feeling? Well, you know, that's sort of a red herring right there. When Kim Davis swore an oath to uphold the Kentucky Constitution, it had a provision in it that 77 percent of Republicans supported in a ballot referendum to protect traditional marriage. So what happened is the federal government midstream during her uh, career as county clerk changed the rules, but they didn't stay their decision. Now, a lot of times when, it, when the court strikes down a law, they will stay the decision and give the legislative body time to rewrite the law. That hasn't happened in Kentucky. And regardless of the rhetoric on both sides of this, there's an easy solution. In fact, the state legislature plans to meet as soon as they meet and solve this problem, which is to take the county clerk's name off of the marriage license. And I certainly support that. And I, I would like to see our governor call a special session. In the absence of that, you know, there's no reason to have Kim Davis in jail. President Obama was speaking today and he was not specific, but he said there would be retaliation against China for recent hacking incidents against the government and more specifically 
against American businesses. Should he have been more specific? What should be done? I think the president should be specific. It doesn't help us. It doesn't help our economy when he makes vague references. Uh, I, one of the things I'm concerned about is there's going to be another push here on Capitol Hill, ironically, to weaken our uh, private encryption software. You know, the administration has been at, at odds with Apple over how much encryption and safety they can include in their products. And I would contend that the White House should quit trying to force our private companies into having Having less safe uh, encryption and methods of storage of our private information while they're being hacked by other governments. They should f fully endorse Apple's efforts to make products safer and uh, stronger encryption. The Iran nuclear deal looks uh, all but certain to be unchallenged by Congress. So what's next? What can Congress do to have oversight and proper implementation of the deal? You know, this deal should have been called what it is, and that's a treaty. In May, on May 14th, we voted for something called the Corker Carton Bill that turned the treaty approval process on its head. Normally, treaties require two thirds approval by the Senate, and that's according to the Constitution. Secretary Kerry, when he was asked here in the House of Representatives why this isn't a treaty, said, You know what? It's too hard to get a treaty passed. So he basically admitted this is a treaty, but they went about it uh, getting approval in a different way. And I think we lost the, the high ground. Congress lost the argument in May when we passed sort of the fast track for the Iran deal. And, and here we are. Uh, I'm afraid there's very little we can do, although, you know, I certainly don't want Iran to get a nuclear weapon, and I uh, did not vote to approve this deal. What role should the United States play in the Syrian refugee crisis? It's growing every day. Well, first of all, I think we need to relook at our foreign policy. We are one of the main drivers of this refugee problem. Just like we destabilized Libya when we took out Gaddafi, we are uh, destabilizing, have been, and continue to destabilize Syria. We have uh, all but declared war on Bashar Assad. And, um, you know, he was a secular leader. This has empowered the Islamic radicals in Syria. Uh, they, they pushed out the Christians and all, and all the reasonable uh, individuals there and secular uh, you know, groups in Syria. So I think we need to take responsibility. We need to, first of all, look at what the driver is and what the cause is. And I think we should, we should stop, the, this administration should stop, and certainly because it doesn't have the approval of Congress, it should stop. It's, uh, it's uh, you know, uh, fascination with getting Assad out of power. But if, like you say, we destabilize the region, then isn't it our responsibility to take some of these refugees into this country? We've got nine coming to Cincinnati just recently released, nine, but that's, that's going to be the beginning. You know, I think um, we, we do have a responsibility here, but these refugees need to be fully vetted. And um, when I look at these refugees, sometimes they're, they're all adult males. Uh, I think we need to be looking at families that have been displaced, and we definitely need to uh, take a, a, a hard look at the type of people that we're letting into this country. There's no obligation for us to admit radical Islamists or ISIS into this country. So we need to make sure that we don't, while at the same time being compassionate to the refugee problem that, frankly, we have caused. Let's turn to the debate tonight. Are you going to be watching? Are you endorsing? And what would you like to see come out of the debate? Is there an issue that hasn't been addressed right now that is so important that it should start to come to the forefront? I would love to see him talk about the balance of power between the executive, legislative, and judicial branches. As a member of Congress, I've seen our power atrophy, particularly under this current speaker, through inaction and, you know, through assertions by the judicial branch and the executive branch. I'd like to see a little schoolhouse rock discussion about how government's supposed to work on the presidential debate, and I'll be rooting for Senator Rand Paul from Kentucky. And you will be watching, right? Absolutely, I'll watch. If I, if I have to TiVo it, I'll watch it. <laughs> Is there something you would like to say now to people in the tri-state? I would just like to say that Congress is broken, 
I am uh, one of the few up here that will acknowledge that on TV and in the media. Uh, I don't want to be part of a circus. I want to be part of a solution. And so, uh, you know, I'm part of an effort to get us back to regular order here. We're, we've created these crises. The fact that we're talking about a government shutdown, that's on Congress's shoulders. We should have passed 12 appropriations bills. And frankly, I think we need new leadership here in the House. And I'll be working to achieve that over the next few months. Congressman, thank you for joining us this afternoon. Thank you very much.